Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Thanks uh, for waiting, thanks for the patience. We tried adding a little drama to our event, just like at the Oscars, just to get everyone excited of who, what's coming next, but maybe we added too much drama to it. So thank you again for the patience. Today, we are here to speak about the Cyber Resilience Act in Connect University. Now, as some of you might know, in Director General of DigiConnect, we started back in 2015 with the project, uh, and we are the knowledge sharing flagship initiative of DigiConnect, which aims to update both us, the EU staff, and of course you, the audience, about the latest digital trends and how they affect digital policies. The scope of our sessions in general is to put at the same digital table EU institutions, industry, academia, and international organizations, helping us find inspiration from one another, as well as try and uh, identify current opportunities, as well as threats to digital policymaking. For those of you who are not connected via Slido, we invite everyone to please do so, because uh, this is your chance to ask, ask questions, and then we'll make sure that they make their way towards the speakers. So slide that though. Over there, you can use the code cyber resilience. So if you also want to share any insights of today on social media, we, we encourage everyone to use the hashtag connect university, as well as hashtag CRA. For those of you which need to leave sooner, uh, the recording of the session will be available as of next week on the Digital EU channel on YouTube, and we'll make sure to add links in the chat. Uh, in terms of future events, we will have one in computing technologies, as well as on blockchain services, and more information is to come as well on Futurium and as well on the Twitter account. Now then, for our session on today, on the Cyber and Resilience Act, we have experts, which will uh, <laughs> better answer your questions and as well get you more about the context, future steps, where are we now? So for those of us which are non-experts, such as I, and for those of you which are more familiar with the matter, we have with us today, from the EU Commission team, Christiana Kierketer de Viron, Head of Unit Cybersecurity and Digital Privacy Unit in DigiConnect. And we have three policy officers from the same unit Raluca Stefanuk, Benjamin Bugel, and Michael Forenbach. So please, Christiana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I think I will also start on my behalf, of course, to apologize and thank everyone for the wait. Uh, I would like to also specifically thank Anonymous for making many great jokes in the chat. It certainly also lightened the mood in this room. So as we said, we're here today to discuss the Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, we're going to make a presentation and afterwards we're, of course, happy to um, take questions uh, from everyone participating. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, because where to start when we talk about Cyber Resilience Act? Well, uh, some of what is uh, in the Cyber Resilience Act was, of course, already mentioned in the cybersecurity strategy of 2020. But the real, let's say, uh, starting gun, I think, on the CRA went off with the uh, State of the Union speech of uh, President von der Leyen um, last year in 15 of September when she launched the notion of the CRA with the words if everything is connected, then everything can be hacked. And that is really, um, the, I would say, the raison d'etre of the CRA, uh, because of course it's a question of addressing, I would say, the missing puzzle of the EU legislative framework for cybersecurity and take a serious look at product security. Um, what is also interesting is, of course, that on the date, I would say, in one year, uh, this amazing team that's sitting with me today uh, managed to pull together the impact assessment, 
consult with industry, with other stakeholders, with international partners, and so on. So actually, one year later, we delivered the uh, Cyber Resilience Act, which is now in co-decision. Um, if we take the next slide. So as the president said, when everything is connected, then everything can be hacked. And indeed, this is the major worry here. What we see is that uh, the amount of connected uh, products and connected devices is growing. Uh, it's exploding. We expect to have around 75 billion uh, products by 2025. At the same time, another thing we also see exploding is the amount of cyber attacks. And we know that the large majority of these vulnerabilities are fully exploitable over the, impact, uh, over the internet. Now, one could ask yourself, well, why, how come that the products are not secure then? Well, as our impact assessment also showed, there's actually very little incentive for our manufacturers and for our developers to produce secure by design hardware and software. It's very much a market that's driven by speed to market, by driven by innovation, and therefore security is not the major concern of the producers. Next slide. Another thing which we uh, certainly also see uh, exploding is the amount of uh, discovered vulnerabilities. Of course, that's linked to the fact that we have many, many more products on the market. But we put here on the slide also for you to have a look at some interesting facts that says a little bit about what are actually uh, the challenge when it comes to vulnerability in products. Because as you will see, vulnerabilities are basically everywhere. And, you know, I think one of the most striking things is if you look at 63% of our mobile apps, they contain an average of 39 known vulnerabilities in open source components. And at the same time as we see this amount of discovered vulnerabilities increasing, we also know that the market for vulnerabilities is increasing a lot. Uh, yesterday I saw a paper from 30U that said that um, now we have a Russian company, so a so-called exploit broker, who's offering one and a half million uh, euros for, uh, for vulnerabilities uh, in Signal, which is, of course, the uh, messaging device we use. So this to say that, you know, one thing is that the vulnerabilities are there. The other thing is that we also know that the bad guys are very much looking for them and looking to make money from them. We already know the consequences of this. And if we go to the next slide, we see some of these, let's say, most noteworthy examples, Wanna Cry, the Pulse, uh, Pulse Secure uh, incidents, Kasaya, Vakada, and so on. These are all huge incidents that cost billions of euros and that have also uh, been, I would say, very likely also have been used as a trigger for future uh, attacks. But if you look at, say, say, beyond these very big examples, every year we have around 5 trillion euros uh, of cost related to cybercrime. That's a figure from 2021. So behind these big examples, you also have a wealth of smaller incidents, incidents hitting governments, hitting businesses, hitting, hitting private citizens, and so on. And this is also part of the story of why we need to fix vulnerabilities. It is that we need to secure basically everyone. If we go to the next slide, we see here the role of vulnerabilities, why they are important. Because actually, if we look at the incidents that were reported on the NIS, then two thirds of these incidents are the result of vulnerability exploitation. So if you wanna put your finger of somewhere in an attack chain where we need to take action, vulnerabilities is the right place. Next slide. Now, we are not the only ones in the world who have understood how big a problem that is. Uh, many of our partners are also looking at how to deal with vulnerabilities. So we have in the US, we have an executive order, uh, which is requirements for critical uh, software that's delivered to government customers. We have voluntary schemes in Japan and in Singapore. In the UK, they're looking at uh, proposals uh, for requirement for consumer internet. Uh, products, uh, IoT. So a lot of things is going on globally. Um, and I think this can lead us to two conclusions. First of all, that we're not unique in that sense, that many are going down the same road. But at the same time, that this is also a unique opportunity for Europe to lead by example and to set the global standards. And here I'm talking both figuratively 
and literally, because if we act with speed and ambition on this proposal, we will be the ones who are setting the standards for cybersecurity requirements in products in the world. Now, what is really behind the CRA? Next slide. So, I think if you are going to go away from this presentation and remember one thing about the CRA, this is a slide I would recommend for you because it actually explains pretty well in one image what is a CRA all about? Because think of the cheese as a digital product. And what we really want to do is simply to reduce the amount of holes in, the amount of ways into the cheese, so to speak. So taking it from, I would say, a Swiss cheese or an Emmentaler to more of a Gouda-style cheese. The other thing that's also shown in this picture is actually that there is no such thing as zero risk in cybersecurity. It does not exist. There will always be vulnerabilities. You may not have discovered them yet, yet, but they will be there. And that's also why that it's important for this proposal that we're not just looking at the product when it's put on the market, but that the product also contains rules for what to do when we discover vulnerabilities after they're put on the market. And this indeed is all said in this slide. So please remember that this is what the uh, CRA is fundamentally about. Now, next slide, and on a more serious note, I would say if we go to a little bit more serious business, so what are the main elements of this proposal? Well, as I said, first of all, we're gonna lay down cybersecurity rules for the placing on the market of hardware and software. We are going to use, or we are using a uh, framework for legislation which is very well known by industry. It's a new legislative framework, so it's a very well established EU product related uh, framework. Uh, we've used it for many things such as toys and marine equipment and so on. So this is something that, of course, our industry is used to and which they also appreciate. And I think when we were doing the preparations for this proposal, this also came out very strongly from industry. It was to try and use something that we know already because of course, there's already a, a big degree of simplification in repetition. Um, what we do then is that we lay down obligations for manufacturers, distributors and importers. This is classic uh, NLF uh, language. We put down cybersecurity essential requirements across the life cycle, so throughout the life cycle of a product, but with a cap on five years. And then, of course, in order to uh, facilitate the implementation of the Cyber Resilience Act, we are uh, intending and we're actually already working on following this up with harmonized standards, because this is the key thing to ensure a smooth and simple implementation of also for industry. We include, and again, classic element from product legislation, the notion of conformity assessment, where we are differentiating between the level of risk associated with the product, whether we need to go for self-assessment or we need to have a third party conformity assessment. So, so to speak, a sort of ex ante assurance on the security of the product. And finally, as is always the case, we have uh, provisions for market surveillance and for enforcement, and this is of course to make sure that the rules are respected. Next slide. Uh, if we look at the scope of the CRA, uh, so basically the CRA covers products with digital elements um, that are connectable, uh, so that is a very wide scope and in a way is, I would say it's almost easier to say what's not included than what is included, but overall we can say we cover hardware, we cover software, we cover final products, and we cover components. Um, what is not covered at the same time is, uh, so non-commercial products, including uh, open source. This is, of course, important here to underline that this is only the part which is non-commercial because, and here we're not just looking at a, let's say, a typical transaction of, of consumer purchasing a product, but we're looking at commercial in a wider sense. So some f uh, sort of monetization, it could be access to data, it could be provisions of services in connection to the product. That would mean that this open source product would then again be a commercial product and therefore fall under the scope. We're also excluding service uh, software as a service. Uh, so this is covered by NIST 2 and therefore it's not in the scope. Uh, however, it's 
important to also underline that as part of the definition of products with digital elements, we also include remote data processing solutions. We have a number of outright exclusions. So these are products which we see when we screen basically the entire IKEA, we see um, that for these uh, products, there are regulations or directives in place, which assures us that there is a sufficient high level of cybersecurity. So this concerns, for instance, cars, medical devices, and so on that you see mentioned here. Uh, on the next slide, we see the uh, obligations of the manufacturers, because now if we try to put ourselves in the shoes of a manufacturer or a developer if it's, uh, for software, so what does he or she have to do? Well, first, when you're in the phase of designing and developing your product, you have to first assess the risks that are associated with the product. And on the basis of that, you have to look at a number of product-related essential requirements. These are the ones that are listed in Annex 1, and I'll get back to them in a bit. You also have to assess on this basis the vulnerability handling essential requirements. These are also in Annex 1 and you have to develop a technical file. Then you have to go to conformity assessment, so either self-assessment or third-party conformity assessment. You fix the CE marking and you do an EU declaration of conformity. Then you place the product on the market. This is where you shift now to a lighter blue on the slide. And this is where you kick in with the maintenance phase uh, where you have obligations in terms of vulnerability handling you also have obligations to report actively exploited vulnerabilities. So these have to be reported to INISA within 24 hours. And in the same way, if your business uh, has a cybersecurity incident that has an impact on the security of the product, you also have to report that. And this goes on for the uh, five years for the vulnerability handling, but the reporting goes on uh, for the uh, length of the product. Uh, if we go to the next slide, this is to show you some of these product-related uh, essential requirements. So what you will see also from the list here is that these are all high level, they are objective-driven uh, criteria. This is because on the one hand, we have a very wide scope, so one can't be too specific. But on the other hand, it's also important that uh, we have, uh, let's say, uh, criteria or requirements here that can stand the test of time uh, so that technologies change over time but the objectives will remain the same. So all of these as you can see uh, should be uh, based on this risk assessment that I also mentioned before uh, and this of course also and this was a point that was very uh, also came very strongly also from industry is that we cannot do one size fit all and therefore it's important that you have this risk assessment for your product and on that basis you uh, design the correct security features. The other thing that's also important here is that products have to be delivered without known vulnerabilities. That means when you place them on the market you cannot be aware of any known vulnerabilities. And if we go to the next slide, I think if you're a layman you would think well, obviously, uh, why would you put a product on the market that has vulnerabilities? Uh, but the uh, fact of the matter is that uh, studies show that around 50% of manufacturers knowingly place products with digital elements on the market that contain vulnerabilities. And of course, if you may say, yes, but this is maybe a known risk and it's a small vulnerability, but nevertheless, even small vulnerabilities can be used as attack vectors. Uh, in, for instance, a several staged attack, and therefore it is important that we close vulnerabilities before the products come on the market. Um, if we go to the next slide, this will give you an overview of the vulnerability handling requirements that are included. So, uh, very importantly, you have to identify and document dependencies and vulnerabilities, and here we also introduce the notion of an SBOM, so a software bill of material, now, if I use the example of the cheese from before, uh, and we say our digital products are like cheeses, then the S-bomb is, I would say, it's actually what you also see in food industry, for instance, where if you want to sell food, you also have to know where your input is coming from. You have to know what are the 
uh, what you put in your tea so that if one of your suppliers flags that there is an issue with one of them, that you will be able to either withdraw the product or indeed to change a uh, way of producing it. And it's very much the same notion here with S-bombs as well. And we know from the past that these have been, these are very useful. For instance, uh, when we had the big log for j incident, uh, it was like, a, I think, a race for many organizations to find out where they actually had uh, this component in their systems, uh, whether they had it, where they had it, and so on. And with an SBOM, these things, of course, become much easier. As I said before, no known vulnerabilities, and there's a requirement to also address vulnerabilities without delay. Uh, you have to publicly disclose information. When you have fixed your vulnerabilities, you have to have in place a coordinated vulnerability disclosure policy. You have to make um, mechanisms that allow for secure updating. So here is important to underline that we're not talking about supplier push, but consumer pull or customer pulls here. Uh, in, when we're talking about secure updating, and of course, patches have to be delivered without delay, free of charge, and with advisory messages. Uh, and last, I would say there is also the requirement of testing the security, and with that we can move to the next slide, because this is also to show you again things that you would think would be obvious, that you would be, as a producer, you would be testing the security of your product when it's on the market, but that is not an obvious practice. So here we have a study that shows that only half of the German manufacturers use, even though freely available, uh, programs that are allow, or tools that allow you to actually test the security of the products you have on the market. Um, on the next slide, you will get an overview of some of uh, the, let's say, final block of requirements which relate to information and instructions. So this is about uh, uh, having the obligation to affix a CE marking. You have to have the contact information for reporting vulnerabilities. That's extremely important now. We often see that security researchers and ethical hackers, they find vulnerabilities, but they actually don't know how to get in touch with the uh, owners of the products or the companies, it's difficult. We see them sometimes uh, put on Twitter. That's not optimal. Uh, so therefore, it's, inform it's important that this is also available. Uh, if the SBOM has been made publicly available, you should inform where it is available. You should sign your EU declaration of conformity. And you also have to inform consumers and uh, your clients about uh, what type of support you can offer and for how long. Uh, and then on the next slide, uh, just to give you an uh, example of how it would work, because we talked about final products, we talked about components here. So if we take an example of a smartphone, so everything which has been developed, uh, so you see that to the left, so things that have been developed by the manufacturer who are placing the smartphone on the market, well, these things will be part of the final product, and therefore they will be part of the final conformity assessments for him. Things that are developed upstream by other manufacturers for the integration into the final product, well, if they fall with under the, within the scope, so they themselves are connected digital elements, uh, products with uh, digital elements, then they would, of course, themselves go through a conformity assessment, and therefore they will have the CE marking as well. And this will actually help the producer of the smartphone because he will be able to quite simply carry out his due diligence, which is that he, of course, has to also make sure that the different elements that go into his final product are secure. If there are um, elements, and here I think we put in, what have we put? We put in a memory card and we put in some SIM cards. So these are products that are placed separately on the market for users to buy and include, and therefore they do not fall within the responsibility of the uh, of the uh, smartphone producer there. It's rather for the manufacturers of them to ensure that they are conform. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, it's a mastodon slide, I would say. It's a very big slide. It shows you basically in one go what kind of conformity assessment to follow. So you can see that the default category, which we estimate would cover around 90% of the products, uh, would go through self-assessment. So we've given some, some examples below where you can see what kind of things could be covered here. So photo editing, word processing, smart speakers, and so on. So basically products that are not considered critical. We then have around 10% of the products in our estimate 
which can be considered critical. And here we're operating with two levels of criticality. So one critical class one and one critical class two. And class one can still go for using harmonized standards and therefore not go to third party conformity assessment, whereas critical class two will always go to the conformity assessment. So what are the criteria that we use to judge whether a product uh, can be considered uh, critical. So one of them uh, is on the functionality. So does the product carry out cybersecurity functionalities? Is it designed to run with elevated privilege or managed privilege? Does it perform uh, function critical to trust? Or does it have uh, direct or privileged access to networking or computing resources and so on? Then it will very likely fall within such uh, uh, grouping. We also look at intended use. So is this to be used in industrial control systems or under these two sectors? Um, then it uh, also, of course, raises the level of criticality. And finally, we have other criteria such as the extent of impact uh, of a cyber attack, for instance, or a cyber successful cyber incident. So below you see also some of the examples of the products that have been put on this list of critical um, products that is in annex to the uh, regulation. I think in this case, it's also important for us to underline that, you know, when asked, why did you go for a list? Why didn't you just put criteria straight into the regulation? In our opinion, this provides much more legal certainty for companies because you can actually go and look on the list and see, do I have to comply? Do I have to go for conformity assessment? Whereas with criteria, I think it would be much more left up to individual judgment and therefore potential error. So this, in our opinion, is the best way forward as it provides legal clarity. Now we have also a, a, a last provision uh, in the uh, proposal, which is for what concerns highly critical, uh, where we say that we could uh, have uh, or request uh, mandatory EU certification for such products. Um, we haven't actually put in uh, any such products yet, and they will only, of course, be established via a delegated act. But this is really to future-proof the CRA. We do not know what's coming, and therefore it's good to have this, I would say, additional uh, backstop to be able to say, okay, for this type of thing that may come in the future, we really need a very high level. If we go to the uh, next slide, uh, well, this is a very simple slide, and it's just to say that uh, as a producer, you will then be affixing CE marking. Uh, as many of us will know, if we look at our products, this is like, uh, I would say, a global brand almost. It shows that you are conform with European standards. And in that sense, it will also help, I would say, businesses and so on, that when you have the CE marking, you are actually something that consumers can trust. And in that way, it can certainly also help the, the made in Europe I would say that Made in Europe stands for security as well. Uh, that if you're good enough to be on the European market, you have very high standards. Uh, for the next uh, slide, um, and this is just to show you a little bit about the market surveillance powers, because we've also included, of course, uh, into the uh, regulation a number of tools for checks, uh, which will be made uh, uh, at the disposal of the market surveillance authorities, who will be uh, based nationally, so they can uh, carry out document checks, they can request for information, they can carry out inspections, lab checks, and so on, they can carry out security audits on products. When they find that a product is non-compliant, they have various options as well. So they could require the manufacturer to bring the non-compliance to an end, so so to speak, uh, fix the problem. Um, but they can also restrict the making available of a product. And indeed, what we have also foreseen here is to have uh, penalties included uh, for non-compliance uh, in, in severe cases. We finally also have a provision uh, in place, thereby that in exceptional circumstances, we can, as Commission, require ENISA uh, to do an evaluation, and on that basis, we can establish a corrective or restrictive measure via an implementing act, of course, following uh, consultation with the member states. And my final slide uh, will be um, just to show you a little bit as well. Um, some of the costs and benefits that we have prepared 
uh, we looked at in the impact assessment. So when we look at the cost of the uh, proposal as we see it, we do consider that compliance costs could be up to 29 billion euros. Um, there will also be costs related to public authorities for the monitoring and enforcement. At the same time, I think we're also very conscious about the administrative cost that's associated, for instance, with conformity assessment, especially for SMEs and startups. So we're looking at taking a number of uh, actions to, uh, first of all, make it simpler. I think we've given ourselves a good challenge that uh, we would like that basically an entrepreneur in himself should be able to fill out uh, the uh, self-assessment, but we are also using, of course, tools that we can do with uh, Tito Your Program and Horizon Europe to to make this uh, easier on on businesses. And at the same time, we also should not neglect neglect that cybersecurity incidents cost a lot of money for a lot of business all over Europe, and. In that sense, we could also say that, you know, the cost of bad security in products is currently carried out by the many critical infrastructure businesses and individuals that are hit daily by cybersecurity incidents. So, of course, for these, you would see that um, you will see uh, very large benefits uh, from the CRA. We have estimated here, I would say, a very uh, wide range of um, figures for what could be the benefit of uh, closing many of the vulnerabilities. Uh, the other thing that we also consider, of course, as a benefit of having a single, um, a single regulation is that we prevent internal market fragmentation. And then indeed for all the NIST2 uh, entities who have the requirements, for instance, on securing their supply chain and so on, we are certainly also making it a lot easier for them because they will know that if they have a, a, a product and they're using products that have the CE marking that live up to our standards, then this will be easier. And finally, uh, I would flag what I had already mentioned before, that for us, this is also very much an opportunity to be first mover to shape the global standards. And I think it would also be a benefit for our businesses and industry that we have the stand these made in Europe standards and that we will be the ones setting a uh, global uh, benchmark in that regard. And with that, uh, I would uh, like to thank you all for your attention. And uh, we open the floor for questions and you will also get to meet uh, the great CRA team who are sitting next to me and ready to, to take questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Christiana. And indeed, we have received uh, several questions in uh, the chat, so we will try to uh, group them a bit uh, and uh, try to have a logical order maybe to answer them. Um, so first starting, there were several questions about uh, the scope of the Cyber Resilience Act. So one question about which industries and products will be uh, impacted and if all the products and product uh, and industries will be impacted at, uh, at the same time. Uh, so the scope of the CRA uh, covers indeed all hardware and software products, including their uh, components. There is no staggered approach in the CIA. This means that after the entry into force of the CIA, there will be a transition period. Currently, the proposed time is two years after which uh, the CIA will apply. However, to note that there is no retroactive effect um, of, of the CIA, meaning that products that have been placed on the market before the uh, start of uh, or before the end of the transition period uh, don't need to uh, to comply uh, with uh, with the CRA. There's another question about uh, how uh, the CRA targets non-embedded software, so standalone uh, software, and uh, which uh, products uh, are part uh, are considered to be standalone software or not. Uh, maybe Benjamin, you want to give us some examples of standalone software that would fall under the CRA. Yeah, so indeed, um, we are covering software in the scope. Um, so both uh, standalone software, so software that you install on your own, on your device, 
as well as uh, software components uh, that can be integrated into other software as long as those software components are placed on the market separately. So if there is a commercial activity surrounding those um, components, then they would also be in the scope. And yeah, just to give a few examples, so we are talking about operating systems, about um, firmware if it's placed on the market separately, um, and um, about uh, applications that you install, such as uh, mobile phone applications or uh, software that you can install on your on your desktop or on your laptop, including computer games, for example. Um, yeah. Yeah, man, many thanks. Uh, another question also related to uh, to, to the scope um, is uh, that certain uh, products are indeed uh, in excluded. So there has been a question about uh, vehicles. So indeed, certain uh, for certain products that are already um, extensively covered by existing sectoral legislation uh, regarding their, their cyber security um, features, they are not uh, covered uh, by, by the CRA in the addition. So these products are, for instance, um, vehicles, but also uh, medical uh, devices. So their case-by-case uh, -case assessment has been, has been done by the Commission uh, in regard to uh, existing uh, legislation. There's also a question about how the uh, CRA uh, will uh, cover open source and um, how we assess uh, the impact of the, of the CIA on the open source community. Benjamin, you want to take it briefly? Yeah, thanks a lot, Maika. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, we've been reflecting a lot, to be honest, on, on the right approach to open source because we, we know, of course, the sensitivities around open source. We know that, on the one hand, it is extremely critical. So, uh, I mean... Uh, some something like 90% of, of all products um, contain open source components, including many products that power our critical infrastructure. On the other hand, we know, of course, that a lot of open source is um, developed by volunteers, by people who do not try to make money with it. And um, yeah, so um, the approach that we've chosen to open source is basically the approach that we've chosen to the scope overall. We simply delineate between what is considered as a commercial activity and what is considered as a non-commercial activity. So when you um, develop an open source component or an open source uh, software just for free, uh, just for fun basically, or simply at least uh, not to, to directly make money with it, then you're outside the scope of the Cyber Resilience Act and you will not have to comply with our requirements. However, if you're in it for the money, if, you are, if, if, if it's your business model to provide open source uh, products or components, if you're making money with it, um, then you would fall under the scope of the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, to add that um, even for those components that are outside the, the, the scope of the CRA, there would nonetheless be an obligation for manufacturers that integrate those components to undertake a certain due diligence. So you would still be required to check the security of those components and you should ensure that you only integrate components that um, reach a certain level of security. Many thanks. Um, so there are a lot of questions also about the interplay uh, between uh, the Cyber Resilience Act and the Cyber Security Act. So uh, just for the audience to know that um, one of the key aspects of the Cyber Security Act is to introduce a European uh, certification uh, framework. So it sets a framework to develop European-wide uh, uh, cyber security certifications. And some of these uh, certifications are actually under development. So this is the case, for instance, for uh, the European uh, certification for cloud services or um, and even uh, closer to be finalized, the European certification on common criteria. So maybe to say a few words on how uh, these uh, two um, initiatives interlink, because as uh, Christiane explained, in the Cyber Resilience Act, manufacturers have to undergo a conformity assessment. And actually, the Cyber Resilience Act foresees 
that uh, the man in certain instances and when there is a so-called presumption of conformity, the uh, manufacturer can use uh, a European cybersecurity certification to demonstrate conformity with the Cyber Resilience Act. So synergies between the two initiatives are foreseen. Of course, a cybersecurity certification need to cover the actual requirements, uh, the actual essential requirements uh, that, uh, with, with which uh, the manufacturer has to, to comply. Um, and uh, the conformity assessment uh, methodology needs to be uh, equivalent with the one uh, foreseen in the Cyber Resilience Act. So in, in the Cyber Resilience Act, we foresee uh, actually that the Commission uh, can adopt the so-called Implementing Act to specify how an existing European uh, cyber security certification can provide a presumption of conformity with uh, the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, next, uh, questions on more uh, the role maybe of the economic operators. And there was one interesting questions, uh, question, if a company buys customized software, will the company be deemed uh, to be uh, a manufacturer? Benjamin, you want to address it? Yeah, so in principle, yes. I mean, the rule is that whenever you place a product on the market, um, it has to comply with the Cyber Resilience Act's um, obligations or requirements. So it does not matter whether you produce one unit of that product or several units. Um, if you place it on the market, it has to be compliant. Precisely, and there's also uh, the notion indeed of uh, substantial uh, modification. So I think from the moment that uh, an economic op operator s modifies substantially, uh, for instance, a software product, it can become actually uh, the entity putting this new product on the market. So the entity might become uh, a manufacturer. Um, there has been another uh, question also on, on the interplay between the Cyber Resilience Act and uh, the Radio Equipment Delegated Act and how we took into account the requirements and also the existing uh, standardization work. Um, so the requirements of the Delegated Act of the Radio Equipment uh, Directive have, have been closely uh, looked at and are reflected in uh, the essential requirements of the Cyber Resilience Act. And uh, there is no intention uh, for both uh, legislation to apply sim simultaneously. So once the uh, Cyber Resilience Act will apply, uh, the um, delegated act of the radio equipment uh, directive will need to be uh, amended accordingly to avoid any uh, duplication. So this is an important political will to indeed avoid that uh, similar requirements um, apply uh, simultaneously to the, to the same product. So the interplay um, between the two uh, is, a, is a very important uh, priority uh, for, for the Commission. And the same for the ongoing uh, standardization work. Uh, the harmonized standards uh, for the Delegated Act of the Radio Equipment Directive are currently... Uh, or the work has already uh, started. So in the same way, the intention is to build on this ongoing uh, standardization work for uh, the harmonized standards that will support the implementation of uh, the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, sorry, if we move a bit to the, to the obligations, uh, mm -hmm. there were several questions around the obligations on, on the manufacturer. Um, so first, regarding the reporting obligations, there were uh, questions around um, how ENISA will deal uh, with, the, with the reporting that will be done by the manufacturer on actively exploited vulnerabilities or, and or um, uh, incidents. So maybe short, the, our short, uh, one short answer is that these reports will not uh, be made public by ENISA, but ENISA has uh, an obligation to share uh, the, the report uh, as appropriate with um, uh, CSIRTs uh, that have been appointed by member states, for instance, in the case of actively exploited vulnerabilities. 
Um, there's another question on how long uh, these reporting obligations will apply to the manufacturer and if they will last beyond the five years, uh, so beyond the life, uh, life cycle obligation of five years. And there again, the answer is yes. And maybe, um, Benjamin, you can a, a bit elaborate on the five years obligation. There was one question, for instance, how would it work if I buy a smart heating uh, will my software only be supported uh, for five years? And what happens if actually the consumer product has a longer lifetime? So. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for that question. Um, I think it's a very good question. Um, as, as, as we've already explained to you by now, the scope of the Cyber Resilience Act is relatively broad. We are covering a wide range of hardware products and a quite wide range of pro software products. And um, it's, of course, extremely difficult to find a one-size-fits-all solution as regards security update obligations. That being said, um, as a user or consumer, you would, of course, always expect that you receive security updates as long as the, you are using the product, right? And um, on the other hand, of course, we also have manufacturers that develop products they try something new, they bring it to the market, they don't know whether it will succeed or not. And this, the, the security update obligations, they will, of course, uh, they are part of their uh, calculations, of their cost calculations when they launch new products. So um, we decided that it would not be feasible or realistic um, to require basically an infinite, <laughs> infinite um, uh, obligation of security updates. And um, in the first half of the year, we did a public consultation where um, stakeholders and citizens were able to participate. And we also asked the question there, how many years of security updates would you like to see? And um, on average, more or less, the answer was five years. And uh, we feel that the five years is a fair compromise between, on the one hand, the interest of users to receive security updates for as long as possible, but on the other hand, proportionality reflections um, that uh, companies can also, if a product does, fails on the market or is not successful, that they do not need to support it in, indefinitely. So um, that's what's behind it. I mean, we know, of course, there are a few products on the market where you already have obli where you already have companies committed to providing updates for more than these five years, but what we see is that for a huge number of products, these five years are currently not met. I mean, some products are placed on the market and do not see a single update. So we think that uh, the five years are quite ambitious and that they will lead to a significant improvement. And I mean, of course, nothing prevents manufacturers of from going beyond those five years voluntarily. Of course. Um, we are, I mean, there we count a little bit also on the market and on consumers choosing those products where manufacturers commit to providing updates for a longer period of time. And indeed, maybe to add also that, of course, part of the information and transparency obligations of the manufacturer, the manufacturer indeed has to clearly indicate how long the, the product is uh, supported, as uh, Benjamin mentioned. So. There should be full transparency when a consumer buys a product to know exactly how long it will be uh, it will be supported. We have several questions on essential requirements, and in particular, uh, there was um, quite some interest about a software bill of materials. Um, so, what is a software bill of material, Benjamin? If you can maybe explain it a bit in in plain language, and um, uh, people also ask uh, to to receive confirmation that this is indeed an obligation in in the CRA. Uh, but maybe um, you can explain a bit what what are the precise obligations around software bill of material. Thanks a lot. I mean, uh, to start with, uh, the software bill of materials is basically a list of ingredients uh, of a software product. Um, so what does the product entail? Um, ingredients in, in the, in the, uh, when it comes to, to software development are basically components. Um, so usually when a software developer 
produces a new software, they don't start from scratch. Yeah, they don't write all the lines of code by themselves, but usually they they tap into an existing uh, into existing um, components um, of they're called libraries often, and um, they recycle those components and they build functionality on top. So, and then this is how you create a final software product. And the software bill of materials is basically um, a computer generated list. So there's a computer program that analyzes your product and it generates a list of all the components um, that are contained in the product. So the component name, the component manufacturer, the component version and so forth. And uh, this list can then be used by the manufacturer him or herself as well as by security researchers or market surveillance authorities to take a deep look into the product and to check whether there are any components in that product for which vulnerabilities have been discovered. And uh, the idea is basically to help both manufacturers find vulnerabilities in their own products more quickly. So to give you one example, um, there was a year ago, I think, um, um, there was a sorry now I lost my my firm. There was a vulnerability in a um, very popular logging uh, component used to um, used to uh, to log security events and the other events in programs. And um, this uh, component was so popular that it was basically used worldwide in all sorts of products. And many manufacturers, they struggled for a very long time to even find out whether they have been using that component in their own products or not, and whether they've been using it in such a way that it creates a vulnerability in their final products. So the SBOM helps you to track down those vulnerabilities more quickly. Um, yeah. So I am sorry, of course. Um, so we do not, we, we oblige manufacturers to generate S-bombs for their own products, but we do not oblige them to disclose this information to the public. This is um, for security reasons done, but also for intellectual property reasons. Um, so this information is normally only um, used by the manufacturers themselves. However, they of course have the possibility to voluntarily make it public. Uh, there is an ongoing debate actually on whether it actually lowers the security of a product to make it public or not. So we allow the manufacturers to make this decision. We don't make it for them. And um, if market surveillance authorities find problems with the product, they will have the right to request this information from the manufacturer. Thank you so much. Uh, there's also one question on how the essential requirements uh, will be defined exactly. Uh, so there is indeed the uh, intention um, for the, uh, of the Commission to request uh, the European Standardization Organization to develop so-called harmonized standards. So these harmonized standards are very common uh, practice uh, for EU product legislation. And uh, these are standards that basically uh, provide a so-called presumption of conformity with, uh, with uh, EU legislation. So and this will be also the case uh, for the Cyber Resilience Act that during the transition period, the European Standardization Organization will work on developing uh, the needed harmonized standards to specify the, the essential requirements. And in fact, the Commission is already starting to prepare uh, the work and uh, we will fund uh, also um, studies uh, to carry out uh, mapping uh, and gap analysis of existing European and international standards that uh, could uh, be used uh, or at least built upon for uh, the implementation of the Cyber Resilience Act. So here again to stress indeed the crucial role that standards uh, will place to facilitate uh, the implementation of uh, the, the essential requirements uh, included in the, in the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, there are uh, several questions uh, related to um, conformity assessment. 
and also the CE mark uh, that uh, uh, should be affixed by the manufacturer at the end of the conformity assessment. So maybe also to do some general points on um, how uh, the Cyber Resilience Act is related to the so-called new legislative framework and also the blue guide, which includes uh, guidelines on how the new legislative framework uh, works. There have been several questions on that. So really to confirm that uh, the Cyber Resilience Act um, fully uh, uses uh, the model provisions uh, of the new legislative framework and is partly uh, based also on uh, legislation um, underpinning the new legislative framework, so the model for EU product legislation. So for instance, for market surveillance, uh, the Cyber Resilience Act uh, applies uh, the existing uh, EU, um, EU regulation on market surveillance. Um, and the same is true, for instance, uh, for what um, concerns uh, the, uh, the conformity assessment mechanism. So uh, the procedures that are foreseen in the Cyber Resilience Act for conformity assessment built with small adaptations, of course, but built fully on uh, the procedures that are foreseen in, in the new legislative framework and that are well known uh, to manufacturers uh, operating on, on the EU market. Um, on the CE mark, uh, there will be one product will only have one CE mark. So a CE mark typically tells a consumer that the product is compliant with existing uh, product legislation. Um, so it's not uh, a CE mark is not specific to one sector or one uh, product legislation. But uh, once the CRA uh, will be uh, applied, a C mark will tell you also that your product, your connected uh, product is, uh, or connectable product is uh, secure. So one C mark uh, by, by product, and the same is true for the EU Declaration of Conformity, that is a document that basically will list all the uh, product um, legislation that, uh, that apply uh, to, uh, to this uh, specific product and is a sort of passport uh, to, for, for the manufacturer to tell the consumer that the product is, uh, is compliant with all applicable EU legislations, including uh, the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, on, uh, on the conformity assessment, there was a question on who will carry out the conformity assessment. So for the large majority of the product, the conformity assessment will be, can be done by the manufacturer. So it's the so-called self-assessment. Um, however, the CRA also defines a list of critical products um, of class one and of class two. And for products of, uh, for critical products of class two, um, the manufacturer has actually to involve uh, a third party, so so-called conformity assessment body that needs to be notified by a national uh, authority. So this is again uh, the mechanism that is foreseen in the new legislative framework. So member states have to assess the competence of conformity assessment bodies to evaluate the conformity of a product under the Cyber Resilience Act. And this brings us also to uh, actually the critical products and the risk categorization that is applied in the, in the CRA. And so there have been several questions around how we distinguished between class one and class two. And for instance, what makes the difference for a microprocessor to be uh, either in class one or class two, because general microprocessors are in class two. And some people in the audience um, uh, wonder if there's uh, enough legal certainty provided by, by the CRA. Benjamin, you want to address this? Yeah, I mean, so the differentiation between two, I mean, first of all, um, that we do third party conformity assessment is due to the fact that we simply consider some products to be so critical that we need a higher level of assurance beyond self assessment by the manufacturer. Um, and this is why we introduced um, those two classes. Um, we differentiate between two classes because we felt that um, we know, of course, that third-party conformity assessment comes at a cost. It's not free of charge. Manufacturers, they have to, they have to pay the price for that, in a sense. So um, the idea behind the two classes is 
to further reduce the number of um, critical products for which uh, there is no alternative to third-party conformity assessment. So under class one, you can escape third-party conformity assessment if you at least follow a harmonized standard. We feel that for the vast majority of products that are critical, this would be enough because um, the, the, the harmonized standards already provide a very high level of assurance. Um, we've also, um, I mean, we've, Christiane has already presented the slides before, so you've seen the criteria along which we've put products into the critical, into, into the class one and class two, so it's intended use and cybersecurity functionality. But then we also had, of course, other considerations. So um, we know that in particular software manufacturers are often small companies, micro companies. Sometimes it's a single person that develops a product. And um, this is one of the reasons why you will find a lot of software products only in class one and not in class two, because class one allows you to escape conformity assessment under certain third party conformity assessment under certain conditions, which facilitates compliance a little bit for you. Um, then uh, there was a question on uh, microprocessors, why we differ differentiate, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of microprocessors on the market. We feel that it would not make sense to require third-party conformity assessment for all of them. So we've limited to mostly general um, micro, general purpose microprocessors, so general purpose CPUs, because they have a much higher degree of complexity, and we feel that with this added complexity, there's also an increased cybersecurity risk. So this is why you find those um, products in class two. Yeah. Did I answer all the questions? Yes, and maybe to add that we will define. Ah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, right. Um, so the list that you see in the annex, this class one and class two, I mean, these are high level product categories. And um, we feel that they do not yet provide enough legal certainty for a manufacturer to really determine whether he or she is actually falling under this uh, class one or class two pro product criteria, which is why we have introduced in the proposal also an empowerment for the commission to further specify by providing definitions. So once the Cyber Resilience Act enters into force, the Commission will very quickly um, provide, based on consultation of experts, um, a further set of definitions to specify uh, the products that are listed in the Annex to provide enough legal certainty to manufacturers to know whether they have to do third party or self-assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are, we are slowly um, running out of time. Um, I think uh, there was also a question to, to specify a bit the timeline um, around the, the CIA and where do we currently uh, stand in uh, the legislative process. Uh, so maybe we can address this one as well. Um, and again, to reiterate, because I see many questions popping up on that, that the blue guide uh, can indeed be used as a guidance on the different concepts that are used in the CRA. For instance, as regards, uh, you know, the notion of placing on the market, economic operators, how you define a manufacturer, distributor, importer. So again, we have made adaptations in the Cyber Resilience Act uh, of course, to adapt it to uh, the, the topic we are tackling, which is cybersecurity, to adapt it to uh, our life cycle approach and the nature of software. But uh, the cyber resilience uh, largely builds on model provision of the new legislative framework. So the blue guide uh, is a very good document to understand and dive into uh, uh, the different uh, notions of the EU product legislation. Um, in terms of uh, timeline, um, where we are currently are, so the Cyber Resilience Act has been adopted on the 15th uh, of September. Um, we have now uh, started uh, engaging, uh, of course, with all relevant uh, stakeholders, and it will be now, the ball is now more in the court of the code legislators, so uh, the Council of the European Union and the European Parliament, who are basically preparing uh, to, to start the negotiations. Um, 
And uh, we hope, our, our hope as, as Commission is that the negotiations will, of course, uh, progress swiftly and uh, that we uh, achieve, let's say, an adoption um, in view of the upcoming uh, elections, will, which will uh, be in spring 2024. So our aim um, is, um, is indeed to, to, uh, to succeed in, in finalizing, finalizing the negotiations uh, by then. In terms of um, entry into force, the uh, Cyber Resilience Act will enter into force uh, once it will be adopted by, by the in EU institutions um, and it will be published in the official journal of the European Union and then it will enter into force shortly after and then a so-called transition period will start for the ecosystem to, to get ready and as I already mentioned this transition period will also be crucial to ensure that the standardization work uh, can be finalized in view of the actual application of the, of the Cyber Resilience Act that uh, for now we have proposed will start two years after the entry into force. Um, on, um, on the committees, who will get the lead file? Uh, well, this, uh, the best is to, uh, to address the question to the European Parliament. Um, and indeed, uh, that the, the committees uh, currently, we understand that each rear uh, has positioned itself, but the committees still need to be uh, confirmed um, in, in the next uh, few weeks or months. So I think with that we have uh, tried, there are still many questions we know that uh, might have not uh, been answered, but we hope that, uh, you know, we, we have uh, answered as many uh, questions as, as possible. And of course, our team is very much uh, available also to, to engage uh, bilaterally. Um, with that, maybe I will pass uh, the floor back to, um, to Christiane uh, to say some concluding uh, remarks. Many thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm not going to say much uh, beyond what uh, Mike and Benjamin has, of course, already said. Uh, simply also to uh, thank uh, Alex and his, his team for organizing um, the event today and for, of course, the uh, team to be ready to uh, answer the questions. As Michael also said, we are very happy to also engage uh, in case you want to have further conversations with us on the CRA. And then finally, um, I just want to thank you all uh, for following today and also say that if you're interested in following more closely what we're doing in DG Connect on cybersecurity, I would also invite you to follow us on Twitter at the at cybersec underscore EU, uh, where you will be able to also re uh, get more frequent updates on what's actually going on in, in our part of the commission. Uh, but as I said, open invitation also to get in touch in case you have uh, queries or worries. Thank you. So, indeed, we've come at the end. Thank you all for the patience at the beginning. I hope the interaction was good for you. And indeed, we saw a lot of interest. So then maybe, who knows, maybe next year, then we can do another session uh, where we could update you on any specific advancements in the area. And on next time, let's hope to see everyone on the sessions on Hypeak and on the session on blockchain services. Again, the recording of today will be available on YouTube as well as the slides on Futurium. Thank you everyone for being here and hope to see you next time.